said, uh, brethren, the Bible says that's absolutely wrong. And a Christian should never do that. And uh, we must not do it that way. And they said, Brother Sean, we know the Bible says that, but this is Japan. And in Japan, this is how we do this. He said, but brethren, the Bible says, they said, we know that. But this is Japan. You've got to understand Japanese culture. He said, but brethren, the scripture says, they said, we understand all of that. But what you're not hearing us is that this is Japan, and in Japan, this is how it's done. And I often, when I came to Japan, would encounter that same attitude. And then I realized when I pastored in the Caribbean, people, all of whom had come from the Gold Coast or Ghana previously, and their culture, when Brother Rodenbush came, who was a missionary to Ghana, he said, I feel like I'm right back in Ghana. Everything here, the culture here is identical to Ghana. And well, because that's where all the culture comes from. But I would often encounter folks say, well, Brother Lucas, you don't understand the island culture. I'd say, well, the Bible says, but Brother Lucas, in, here in the island, and when I was in Guam and Micronesia, it was the same thing. And then I would hear, over the years, I'd hear people say, in our family, this is how we do things. But Brother and sister, the Bible says, I know, I know, but, but you don't understand where we're from. This is how we do this. Oh. In, our, in our culture. And one day I was really praying and asking the Lord how I could help folks understand that what they were doing was not wise. And I felt like the Lord gave me this little study, this little lesson, illustration that has helped me a lot. I think it's helped quite a few folks. It's so simple. It's so simple. You start out with a quadrant, which is a square with four blocks. And over here is the Word of God. Some things.
you go to New York City, that's a whole different world from the culture in West Virginia and Tennessee. It's like different countries. They're different as can be. But so culture has some things it says yes. Yes. Culture says yes. You should but some things culture says no, you must not. So here we have culture says yes. Here culture says yes. Here culture says no. Here culture says
He took that child. And the whole congregation just sitting there wondering, what is he going to say? <laughs> and he held the, that little infant up. And he said, now, folks, there is a real baby. <laughs> <laughs> he spoke the truth in love. He didn't hold up and say, sure is an ugly little critter, isn't it? You know, the Bible says, the fool says everything he thinks, but a wise man will hold some things in to another time. You know, it doesn't hurt us to be kind, even when we speak the truth. Dad's aunt was a wonderful, wonderful cook, phenomenal cook. And she was famous for the cakes she made. Everybody loved her cakes. When they went to a family reunion or any church dinner, everybody made sure they, they, they wouldn't wait till later to get dessert her cake. They all try to get a piece of her cake first because it would be gone right away. And one day my dad was at her house and Bernie had made a cake and she said, Richard, I got a piece of cake. You, uh, I got some cake. You want, want some cake? And he said, well, oh, sure, I have Bernie. I'd love to have a piece of your cake. And she said, well, here's some. I was like, get you a cup of coffee and make a piece of cake. So she brought it. He took a bite and it was a moment taste the thing. He, he thought, I don't even know if I can want to eat this. But he just kind of drank quite a bit of coffee and kind of got, took a few bites and she said, talking, she said, the house again. He just, he started talking about the weather. <laughs> Because they're 
culture puts more pressure on them than the church would ever put on them to dress that way. According to exactly what the Bible says. It's funny. It, it, it's really hilarious in some ways. In, in the, the truck I, when I went there, I found out that, that, you know, the Bible says for a lady not to wear that which pertains to a man. You know, in the truck islands, they have no problem with that. Because it's illegal. A woman will be thrown in jail and have to pay a huge fine if she wears a garment that pertains to a man. In Burma, that's no problem. Because in Burma, it's against the law. A woman can go to prison for wearing a garment that pertains to a man. So we have no problem with that in those areas. What's interesting, though, in the truck islands, though a woman is not allowed to wear a garment which pertains to a man, many of the women from the waist up wear nothing. Getting them to put some clothes on on the top is, is a little more struggle. Because that's against their culture. See, everywhere in the world, there's some things that culture says yes and the Bible says yes. Or culture says no and the Bible says no. But when it comes to those areas where the culture says yes, you should do this, you must do this, but the Bible says no, you must not do this. Or where culture, the Word of God says yes, you must do this, and culture says no, you must not do this. For example, some woman years ago in America decided that she didn't think she was an atheist and she filed a lawsuit against the school that they were not allowed to have prayer in school. That's become the most idiotic thing in all the world. Do you know when they had prayer in schools in America they didn't have shootings in, in school. They didn't have all the discipline problems in school when they had prayer in school. When you throw God out you ask him for trouble. <laughs> Amen. And then they started teaching the kids that they were evolution. They were nothing but a higher evolved ape or a higher evolved animal. So they started acting like animals. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. It is important. But, but they said... You must not pray. You must not pray in school. Put the Bible. I mean, I remember Daniel was told you must not pray. The law said you must not pray. But he knew as a child of God he had to pray. The Word said pray. Culture says don't pray. The Word said you must pray. The law said you must not pray. I've known folks before that say, Brother Lucas, I know the Bible teaches that a lady should not wear that with potential men, but on my job they require me to wear this. I've known preachers before that have told the people, well, when you're at work, they require you to wear that, so go ahead and wear it. But when you're away from work, at home, don't wear that. Well, there are a lot of people that in this world that have jobs that contradict what the Bible teaches. People who work for the mafia. They have a job of beating people up, extorting money from people. We don't tell them when they come to the Lord, well, I know your job requires you to beat people up and steal from them. So when you're at work, go ahead and do that. But when you're away from work, don't because it's wrong. Someone is a prostitute. We don't tell them, well, when you're at work, it's okay to go ahead and commit fornication because your job requires it of And the Lord, when he saved you, he already knew you as a prostitute. No, we tell them you need to get a different job. If the job requires you to do wrong, you better get a different job. A job requires us to do wrong or culture requiring us to do wrong, or even the law requiring us to do wrong, is no excuse. But here is where our loyalty to the Word of God is shown. Am I loyal to the Word of God? If culture says, yes, you must do this. If my family says, yes, you must do this. If my friends say, yes, you must do this. If my job, my boss, my the law, the government says you must do this, but the Bible 
must not. Which one am I going to obey? That shows how loyal I am to the Word of God. If I only obey the Word of God when it's convenient to me, I'm not loyal to the Word of God at all. When culture says one thing and the Word of God says a different, if I obey culture, then culture is my God. The Lord is not my God. I'm serving culture, not God. But if culture says one thing and the Word of God says another, and I say, well, I'm obeying the Word. Whatever it costs me, I'll obey the Word. The three Hebrew children culture said, you must bow before this image. <laughs> now there are those that would say, well, in fact, I was told when you go to a Japanese funeral, you know, you have to light the candle and put it there and you have to kind of mumble a prayer and clap your hands to that spirit of that person. Well, I don't want to offend anybody. But the Word of God says praying to the dead is wrong, and in the Bible it said it was punishable by death. Amen. So culture may say I have to do that when they have told me before you. Why don't you fuck and do that now? And I tell them, I'm sorry, I'm a Christian. They say, oh, you're a Christian. Oh, okay, we understand you don't do that now, do you? A person who knows anything about Christianity, if I would go ahead and do that, and then afterwards they found out I was a Christian, they'd say, he's not much of a Christian, is he? I would have destroyed my testimony. Just trying to please people. When it comes down to, am I going to please God or am I going to please man? Which one am I going to obey? Which one am I going to please? If I'm, gonna, if, if it comes down to, well, I like doing this. I enjoy this. And if I obey the word of God, I can't do that anymore. Well, am I going to be? make up my mind. I believe God and I'm going to obey Him no matter what. That's not truly the Lord. Amen. Amen. That shows it's engrafted in my heart. I'm not doing it because I'm part of a religious group that tells me to do it. I'm doing it because I love God. Because I believe His word.
says, you believe there's one God? Well, that's real good. So does the devil believe in one God. It makes him fear and tremble because he knows he's not doing right. But he does believe in one God. Amen. It's not believing in God's existence. And they'll point back to Abraham where the Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And they'll say, see there, if I just believe God, it's counted to me for righteousness. Well, that's true. When Abraham believed God, what did that mean? God had just finished speaking to Abraham. He had spoken certain things to Abraham, certain commandments and certain promises. And Abraham believed what God had said. When it says Abraham believed God, he meant God was telling the truth. He meant that he believed God wasn't lying to him. That if God said it, that's how it was. He, he had that kind of faith or confidence in God. Faith is not just believing God exists or believing there's a God or believing. There are many people call it faith, but they believe the opposite of what God said. They believe that even though God said it, He don't mean it. And even though He said it, they don't think it's true. That's not faith. That's unbelief. It's not faith to believe whatever I want to believe about God. It's faith when I believe that God meant what He said and His Word is true. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 at all the people who who the Bible lists them as people, great people of faith. Every single one of them, the reason they are there is they believe that what God said to them was true. They didn't just believe something about God. They believed the Word of God. And because they believed the Word of God, they, they, it says Noah being warned of God. By faith, Noah being warned of God, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. What does that mean? God spoke to Noah. He said there's going to be a flood. He said you can be saved. Your family can be saved. But here's what you've got to do to be saved. You must build an ark. It must be this long, this high, this wide. It must, must be made out of this material. It must have only one door. And he gave them the exact dimensions of everything. The exact type of material he had to use. He said, you've got to use asphalt all over the outside of tar. Or asphalt all over the outside. Not asphalt like pavement, but, but like tar. All over the outside and all over the inside. Well, Lord, I don't like the smell of tar. I don't want to stay in some old boat for a year that's got the smell of tar side of it. Whether you want to live or die, do you believe God or not? Do you have faith or not? Noah believed God. And it says he, everything God said to him, he did it exactly that way. And because of his faith that what God said was true, his faith saved him. Was he saved by works? You say, well, he was building that boat. If he'd have had to be wouldn't have built the boat. No, God said build the boat. Faith demanded he built the boat. You say then he is trying to earn his salvation. No, he is just trying to obey God. He knew he didn't deserve for God to make a way of salvation for him. He didn't deserve for God to preserve his life. He found grace in the eyes of God. It was the grace of God that gave him the plan. It was the grace of God and the help of God that helped it all come together. It was faith that said, God said it and I believe it and I'm going to live the way God said because I'm going to be loyal to the word of God. That's what faith is. It's being, believing God's word and being loyal to the word of God. When we are not loyal to the word of God, it is a testimony of our unbelief and, and the and our lack of faith that would cause us, if we really believe God, we're going to obey Him. If we don't Amen. obey Him, because we don't really believe Him. Yes. Amen. So when it says, there are some people say, well, I know the Bible says that you need to repent, but I don't think it's necessary, and I don't think God's going to send. If they believe in Him, 
I don't think God will send somebody to hell just because they didn't repent. Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. When you say, I don't believe they're going to perish, you're saying, I don't believe Jesus told the truth. I believe Jesus is a liar. Well, I'm going to tell you, Jesus was not a liar. And if you believe that, you got a problem. If you got faith in God, it's going to tell you that Jesus meant what he said. When he said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And repent didn't mean just to change his idea or his mind about it. It meant to turn from sin and turn to God. Amen. To walk away from sin and start following the Lord. To make up his mind he was not going away from God and doing his own way. He's going to turn away from that and way, walk the way God would have him to walk. That's what repentance is. Amen. A person who will not turn away from sin has not repented. A person who will not turn from sin and turn to God has not repented. Repentance is to turn away from sin and turn to God. Turn our back on sin and begin to follow the Lord. Walk with Him. That's what repentance is. So when I say, well, I don't, I don't, you know, the Bible says, tells us who is going to be cast into the lake of fire. And one of it mentions is all liars. And some people say, well, I, I don't think God is going to send me to hell just for a little lie. Well, then you believe God's a liar. It says all liars will be cast into the lake of fire. Either all liars will be cast into the lake of fire or God lies. I'm going to tell you, God didn't lie. Amen. And if I walk with him by faith, I'm going to know I cannot afford to lie. I've got to be honest. i got to be upright. i got to do right. Amen. Faith will demand that of me. Why? Because I believe God. He said all liars will have their part to live with I don't want to be those that have, one of those that has a part in the lake of fire. He didn't say, well, all liars except those are pretty good people. <laughs> or all liars except nice guys. <laughs> or all liars except those that's not so bad. <laughs> or all liars except those that was lying because they was afraid if they told a lie they'd get in trouble or get their friend in trouble. If they told the truth, they thought they'd get in trouble or get their friend in trouble. So... People, all liars, except those who was lying because they didn't want to get somebody in trouble, themselves or somebody else. That's not what he said. He said all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. If I believe God, I believe that. If I don't believe that, then I don't believe God. And if I don't believe God, that's a lack of faith. Faith is believing that God means what he says. His word is true. If I don't believe his word is true, I am not a believer. Being a believer means loyal to the word of God. Amen. If God said it, he means it. And it's going to be just that way. It don't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what somebody else said. If God said it, friend, that is how it is. That is just how it is. It's going to be just like he said. He has never lied yet. The Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. That means if he said it, friend, you can mark it down. It's going, when it's all said and done, you're going to see it was exactly like God said it would be. Every single detail. Amen. So I better be loyal to the word of God. That's why James said, to receive with meekness, the engrafted word with meekness. That means you don't argue with it. You don't fight against it. You don't resist it. You don't resist it. You open your heart and receive it with an attitude that if God said, that's the way I want to live because I believe God. If God tells me don't do this, then I don't want to do it. It doesn't matter what culture, my job, my boss, my nationality, my ethnic group, or nothing else says. If God said don't do it, I'm not going to do it because I want to I wanna walk with God. I want to have a fellowship with God. I want to I wanna know the Lord. And I believe Him. Well, that's faith. That's walking with God by faith. And if God says, tells me, don't do something, then I don't want to do that. If it's 
says to do something, then that's how I want to live. Because God's word is true. Amen. It's amazing to me how many people call themselves Christian and do not believe God's word is true. That is absolutely amazing to me. And they'll say, well, I walk with God by faith. Well, praise God. Did you believe this? Well, no. Well, the Bible says it. Yeah, but I don't think that's necessary. Well, he said it is. Yeah, but I don't think that's all that important. Well, he said it is. But yeah, but I, I just... Uh, well, you're not going to be judged on what you think or what I think. We're going to be judged on what God said in His Word, and God's Word is right. And if you're a believer, you believe God's Word. If you don't believe God's Word, you're not a believer. You're an unbeliever. And the Bible tells us all unbelievers are going to be cast in the lake of fire. I mean, people who didn't believe God told the truth. They didn't believe what God said. God said it. They didn't believe it. I don't want to be one of those. God does not want you to be lost. God does not want you to be lost. Amen. He wants you to be saved. He paid an incredible price at great sacrifice because he wants you to be saved. Look at all those that believe God. You read there in Hebrews 11. Every one of them. Abraham, by faith, went out. Not even knowing where he was going. Why? Because God told him to go out. Told him, you go and then I'll show you where to go. And Abraham became the father of those who walk with God by faith. That trust God enough that if he tells you to do it, you do it. Even if you don't even know where it's going to take you or what the end result will be. You just do it because that's what God said and you believe God. You believe him enough to say that's the way I'm going to live. That's what I'm going to do.
Any man preach any other gospel unto you than, than that you have received, let him be accursed. How loyal are you to the word of God? Many of you, you were here last Sunday. You couldn't be here Thursday night. I'm going to talk to you a minute before. I, if I could, you know, they say that repetition is the essence of learning. And so you can't get this in your own spirit or in your mind or your understanding too much. If you can get hold of this thing, it will put something in you that nobody, no devil, and nobody will ever take out of you. And what I'm saying about this is absolutely a fact. I'll mention this again, that if you can listen to a, a message about this, it's, preached, it's on YouTube, preached by Brother Lee Stone King, and many of you know him, what an incredible man. Met with an amazing evangelistic or prophetic ministry. It is called three. Is it types or kinds? Types. Three kinds of Christianity. Three kinds of Christianity. The amazing thing, you know, I went to Bible school, this was never explained in this way. But you can pick up any church history book, any church history book, and you will read, they will progress through these th things, same three steps, and they will tell you emphatically. This is not some mystical, weird, strange thing. The first type of Christianity, the first kind that you will read, and that there's today in this world, there's really only three kinds. And all the churches that exist and call themselves Christian, they will fit in one of these three. Amen. The first is the the first is the apostolic Christianity. And that is basically from about 33, or depends on when you date the church having started 33 A.D. through 100 A.D. when the last of the apostles died. And even when the apostles died, John said that there are those who have gone out from us, started other groups. They are not of us. They've gone out because they really weren't of us. And John said this. He said, you can tell, here's, here's how the spirit of truth and the spirit of error is manifested. He that is of God heareth us. He was talking about himself and the other apostles. He that is of God heareth us. He that heareth not us is not of God. He is of the devil. In other words, he was saying just like Paul said. Paul said if it preaches a different gospel than the one he preached, he's cursed. He is a curse. Amen. John said, he said if they believe it like we preach it, they are of the spirit of truth. If they don't believe it the way we preach it, it's because they are of the spirit of error. Amen. Each of these three Christianities has a completely different plan of salvation that they preach. Completely different. You can read with no question whatsoever, and I don't know really anybody that would disagree, the Christianity of the early church, the message of salvation they preached, you can read it in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. At the birth of the church, you look at Luke 24, 47, Jesus said that he told them what the message would be preached, that it would be the same message in all the world. He said it would begin in Jerusalem. Amen. He said the message will be repentance and baptism uh, and remission of sins in my name in the name of Jesus. And he had given to the apostle Peter the keys of the kingdom. He said, you'll be the one that will open the door. You'll be the one that what you buy on earth will be bound in heaven. What you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Amen. The apostle Peter got up and preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When he finished, they said, what do we do? And what he said to them, you could go many churches today and they would tell you 
If someone were to simply quote what Peter said, there would be preachers that would say, you don't need to do that. No, that has nothing to do with salvation. You don't need to be telling them that. The Apostle Peter, someone stand and read verse, Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 39. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 39. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter. And I should mention just before that what he had said to them is this same God has made this same Jesus whom you have crucified both Lord, which means God Almighty. They knew from Deuteronomy 6, 4, here O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. One Lord. Paul later said there's one Lord. One thing. One baptism. Amen. It's either this way or nothing. Yes, That's what he was saying. Amen. It's not a bunch of different lords. It's not a bunch of different messages. It's not a bunch of different gospels. It's not a bunch of different ways of being baptized. Amen. It's not a bunch of, uh, of different uh, plans of salvation. He said there's one Lord. There's one faith. One thing, if you're going to believe and get it right, it's got to be this way. And one baptism got to be this way. Anything else is not baptism. Yes. Anything else is not faith. Yes. To fail to believe that faith is to not have faith. To not believe in that Lord is not is to not have the Lord as your Lord. Praise God. Go ahead. And said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them. Here's what, their question. What should we do? Now you preach to us the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We realize we're not right with God. Now what do we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Repent? And Jesus said repentance will be preached. It will begin in Jerusalem. It will be preached in all the world. Peter said repent. Exactly what Jesus said. Jesus said remission of sins will be preached in my name. It will begin in Jerusalem in all the world. Go ahead, repent and and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. He told them to be baptized how? In Jesus' name. For what reason? For remission of sins. Amen. There's only one way of being baptized. If we're not baptized in Jesus' name and not baptized for remission of sins, then we have not been baptized as far as God's concerned. Yes. Amen. Amen. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as, many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. Amen. They preach that everywhere. You can find they preach it in Acts 2 to the Jews. And, and it says, everyone that believed, Peter's words were baptized, and there were 3,000 people added to the church that day. How did they get out of the church by believing what Peter had preached? Yes. In Acts 8, it was the same message that caused the Samaritans to come into the church. They came in the same way, repenting, baptism in Jesus' name, receiving the Holy Ghost. And they spoke with tongues when they received the Holy Ghost. In Acts 10, they came in the same way. They repented, they received the Holy Ghost, speaking with evidence by speaking with tongues, and then they were baptized in Jesus' name. In Acts 19, there were believers, followers of John's baptism. Paul met them. He asked them, if you receive the Holy Ghost, did you believe? They said, we don't even know what the Holy Ghost is. He said, how did you get baptized? He said, well, we were baptized by John's baptism. He said, no, John the Baptist, in that Baptist group, what they did, they baptized people as a sign they had repented, just a symbol of their repentance. That's not Christian baptism. And then, and he says when they heard this, they were all baptized in the name of Jesus, and Paul laid hands on them, prayed for them, and they all received the Holy Ghost, and they spoke with them. Yes. Amen. Every one of them, they got it the same way. Yes. Repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and receiving the Holy Ghost, evidence by speaking with tongues. That's what they preach everywhere. That's how it happened everywhere. Amen. Jesus yes. had said, except a man is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Amen. And the message they preached was water baptism in Jesus' name and new birth of the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, being born of the water by water baptism in Jesus' name, being born of the Spirit by being 
baptized with the Holy Ghost or filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. That was a message wherever they preached. There were miracles happened. People were healed. There were signs and wonders. God worked with them, the Bible says, confirming the word with signs following. He confirmed that what they were preaching was the truth. That wasn't just Peter preaching his idea. All the apostles, Paul preached the same thing. He later said, I went up and, and, and spent 14 days with Peter and he and I compared notes and we found that there was not one point that he was preaching that was in any point different from what I was preaching. Amen. Amen. Paul said what Peter preached, he got directly. Jesus taught it to him directly. But what I preached, I, I was given it by revelation out in the middle of the desert, but there wasn't one point of difference between what Peter preached and what I preached. Yeah. It was exactly the same. Oh, friend, that's powerful. Amen. That's amazing. And God confirmed the word with signs following. Amen. That was the early church. Their salvation message was repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, receiving the Holy Ghost. They preached that there was one God. If you were a Christian in that first century church, if you were known as a Christian, and incidentally, the word Christ means what? The anointed. Christ means the anointed one. Christian, which meant followers of Christ, if Christ means anointed one, then what does Christian mean? It means anointed ones. Amen. Amen. Turn to someone near you and say, we are the anointed ones. If you're a real Christian, a follower of Jesus, you're one of the anointed. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Oh, that was powerful. Yeah. But after the apostles died, came the second Christianity, which is known the Christianity of the yeah. church fathers. They're referred to this in many, uh, in that way, in almost all church history books. And what they taught, they were almost all of them philosophers and lawyers. And they said, you know, the apostles were not very educated men. They were powerful. And there were miracles in their ministry. But that was only for the age of the apostles. And they were not very educated men. The reason they said that is because all these guys were educated in the philosophies of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. And the apostles didn't preach about Socrates and Aristotle and Plato, and they didn't use Plato or Aristotle or, or, or uh, Socrates' notes and teachings and books to teach their followers. They just preached the word. So these church fathers said these men were not very educated. They were not, uh, they, they were not, they, you know, they gave us the word, but they didn't explain it. And they, they preached the word, but they didn't, they didn't hash out all these doctrines. It's been said that the, this age was marked by one word. And almost all church history books will tell you this, that the key word was change. No longer was the preaching marked with great power, anointing, and they didn't want it. They said that's not necessary. It is also often referred to as scholastic theology. That was the age, they will tell you the great thinkers. They said the apostles, they were not very educated. They gave us the word, but they didn't explain it. They didn't give you all the intricacies. And they were, this was a time when there was a lot of mysticism introduced into Christianity. It was also a time of great political upheaval. And Constantine, the emperor, though there had been a lot of persecution against Christians, he supposedly converted, although he was never baptized. He supposedly converted by seeing a sign in the, of a cross in the sky, which said, by this sign, conquer. But the cross that he recognized was not ever referred to as a Christian cross. It was a cross that was known as the symbol of Mithra before there ever was a Jesus. That was the cross that he used and had his soldiers painted as a sign on all of their shields. And it was a political note. And then he said, if you'll, if you'll be part of this Christianity, but he required, in fact, you can read the history of the Council of Nicaea. He brought these leaders together. He excluded those who believed this message. They were not even allowed to come. 
He wanted in Christianity, he said, there's so much confusion between those, between Christianity and between all the different worshipers of all the other gods in our realm and between those who worship Caesar as God. And we want to bring it all together in one thing. And that resulted, eventually that came, that their teaching came to be codified in what we know today as the Roman Catholic Church. And their encyclopedia will tell you that. I mean, there's no secret about it. Church history books will talk, tell you about it. There were several different major figures. Origin of Alexandria, Tertullian, of, 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 of Syria, in that area. Um, there, uh, Cyprian, Arenas, Augustine. Many of these, for example, Origen wrote 27 volumes that he wanted to be included as a scripture, but the, the churches would never accept his writings as scripture. Um, Justin Martyr was one of them. Justin Martyr is the first person in history. You can look this up. Historical record will tell you with no question whatsoever. He was the first person in the history of the world that was ever claimed to be a Christian that was baptized using the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He rejected baptism using the name of Jesus. And he was he said that he wanted to join together the teachings of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. These men taught that God was a three-person God. One substance, but three separate persons. Tertullian also believed that. He didn't believe they were co-equal, co-eternal. He believed that there was one, the Father, who was very big and very great, and you couldn't know him or come in contact with him. Then there was a smaller one, the Son or the Word, that we had more interaction with, and then there was this small one of all that he wasn't really sure what it was except that it was a feeling and he called it the paraclete or, or the dove and uh, it was the, the Holy Spirit and he said those are totally separate, they're not the same at all, they totally have different will, different mind, different personality. That's not the teaching of the apostles, that's not the Jesus of the, of the Bible. If you were a first century Christian, they knew you believed in one God, just as strong as the Jews believed in one God. They knew you believed in repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, being filled with the Holy Ghost, and living a holy, godly life. Yes. And they did not get involved in the immoral, ungodly practices of their day. And they were they were mocked and ridiculed for it. Amen. But that's how they lived. Then the church fathers. That was when the church was married to the world and Christianity that was acceptable. And uh, in Tertullian, Origen is the one who began to teach as a doctrine that baptism in Jesus' name was not sufficient, that should not be practiced, but he began to practice baptism using the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in Alexandria, Egypt. Tertullian went on beyond that and he said, if you baptize in the name of Jesus, you are not a Christian. But to be a Christian, uh, you must be baptized in, in the use of the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And in 384 AD, at the Council of Chalcedon, they added the anathema, which meant it was punishable by death if you were caught to be baptized or baptize anybody in the name of Jesus. But the uh, baptism in use of the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost was the only legal way to be baptized, and anyone who rejected that would be killed. And history tells us that nearly, nearly half of the population of the nation of Spain was killed because they would not accept baptism using the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and they, they held on to baptism in Jesus' name, even to death. Amen. It was origin that first originated baptizing babies. Now that church fathers, their plan of salvation, they taught that you had to be baptized to become a member of the faith community. By and, and it had to be uh, it had to be using the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And uh, you, it was the, they taught baptism for remission of sins. Roman Catholic Church still teaches that today. Baptism for remission of sins. Now they've introduced sprinkling, which was not introduced until 1200 A.D. Up till then, everybody was only baptized by immersion. It was after 1200 A.D. that they introduced sprinkling for baptism. But uh, they preached baptism for remission of sins, 
and that you had to then believe and follow the teachings and practices of the Roman Catholic Church. There came to be so much conflict about that, and you can read this in history also. They had so many people would read the Bible and find out that what the Bible taught and what they were saying was so different. It wasn't anything like what the apostles and priests were taught, that they made it illegal for anyone to have or possess, have any contact with, unless, unless not even the local priests were allowed to have a Bible or any portion of scripture. Only those who were bishops or above were allowed to be in possession of any portion of scripture. If you were caught with a portion of scripture, it was punishable by death. And uh, that's why we intended when he translated the Bible, uh, they, they hated him so bad that he died and they later went and dug up his bones and burned his bones. Uh, they, they, uh, others, they burned uh, John Huss, they burned him at the stake, and uh, other, other men tried to translate the scriptures and make them available to people. But anyone who possessed the scripture would be killed. Uh, it was punishable by death. Then came, now in this period, basically lasted from 100 A.D. up to about 400 A.D. Their messages were essentially codified in what we know today as Roman Catholic Church, and it continued on. That's Christianity is still with us today. That still exists today. Cool. Basically unchanged for the most part from about 400 A.D. Then the third one is the Christianity of the Reformers. The reformers, such as Martin Luther. Martin Luther said he realized that a person did not have to believe all and, and obey all the teaching. In fact, he found that as a, a Roman Catholic priest, he found that many things they were teaching exactly contradicted the Bible, and uh, that many things they were told to do and believe were exact opposite of Scripture. And so he came in contact with the Scripture that just shall live by faith. He said that, uh, that it's not by it's not by keeping all these rules of the Roman Catholic Church, but you have to um, you have to have faith in God. Well, the reformers, as they came out from the Roman Catholic Church, one after another, and formulated their doctrines. In the beginning, Martin Luther said he only wanted to reject those things which were most blatantly contrary to Scripture, and the rest of the things of the Roman Catholic Church he wanted to keep, and that's why. In Lutheranism today, there is so much that is very, very similar. In fact, I had a Lutheran uh, minister tell me, he said, I love to go to the Catholic Church and there, because there's so much uh, pageantry and so much that I see in theirs that we have actually lost in moving away from that too much. And he said, uh, I, 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 what I want to see is the, the Lutheran Church move more and more back to being closer and closer to the Roman Catholic Church. And that is happening today very, very and, uh, but these men, others rejected more. But what it came to be codified, they, they continued to teach the same God, which actually was very similar to what Plato, Socrates, Aristotle taught, that God was three persons, not one. And uh, that he was, he, it was three different persons, but joined in one kind of a family type or a committee type of Godhead. And uh, they continued, they held on to the baptism that the Catholic Church had taught. That is, that baptism was in, using the words Father, Son, Holy Ghost. They rejected baptism in Jesus' name, said we'll keep the same baptism of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But they said we don't believe baptism has anything to do with salvation either. And, uh, they, they said that salvation is by faith alone. It's not by obeying God. It's not by obeying His Word. But if you believe, then you are saved. And it's simply by, you don't need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And no, the reform, or the, this group taught, that some of them taught that when they baptized you, you were filled with the Spirit automatically. Others taught that when their priests laid hands on you, you received the Holy Ghost this group taught that when you believe, you automatically receive the Holy Spirit. Now later, when the charismatic movement came, they they recognized baptism in the Holy Spirit as something different from receiving the Holy Spirit.
Holy Spirit. They believe that when you when you uh, when you believe in the Lord, you receive the Holy Spirit. But then later, some of them believe that you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit through a speaking tongue. But they all of them believe that is not essential for salvation whatsoever. They do not believe baptism has anything to do with salvation. They don't believe that. that in fact, they will tell you that that they do not believe it has anything to do with salvation. They, they do not believe that uh, that being filled with the Holy Spirit has anything to do with salvation. And if you were in one of their churches, if you were, if someone was to say, as they said in Acts two, men and brother, what should we do? And if you were to simply quote the words of the apostle Peter, you would infuriate most of their ministers. They would say that is not right. You do not get baptized for remission of sins. Baptism has nothing to do with remission of sins, and and it doesn't need to be in Jesus' name. And and you don't need to talk to them about receiving the Holy Ghost, what you need to do is talk to them about receiving Christ. Although there is no one in the Bible that ever preached to a sinner and told them you need to receive Christ. That's not in the Bible. They'll, they'll say you need to accept the Lord as your personal Savior. That's not in the Bible. That was the religion of the Reformers, but it is not in the Bible. Nobody in the Bible ever told someone you need to, to uh, receive the Lord as your personal Savior. You need to accept the Lord as your personal Savior. That is not a message that was ever preached to any unbeliever in the Bible. Amen. That came out of, uh, out of Europe from the Reformers, the Christianity the Reformers. Now these three Christianities with their three separate plans of salvation are still on the world today. Both of these, in fact, originally now with the charismatic movement, some of these groups are accepting people speaking with tongues. But I can tell you, even to the time when I was young, and even the time I was a teenager, up until the, the mid-60s, late 60s, until the time of the late 60s, around 1969, 1970, until around that time, nearly every one of these churches that would be churches that came out of the Reformers, nearly every one of them taught that speaking with tongues, that, that speaking with tongues was reserved only. And both of these both of these groups taught that speaking with tongues and miracles were only for the time of the apostles. So when the apostles were gone, it stopped. And then from that time, that anyone who claimed to speak with tongues, it wasn't God, it was the devil. And uh, the, the denomination of both of my grandpas and one of my grandmas were ministers, licensed ministers, and that denomination taught that speaking with tongues was absolutely of the devil. That that happened in the age of the apostles, but it stopped in 100 AD when John died, and that anyone who claimed to speak with tongues today, they were actually demons possessed. In fact, my mom didn't know until years later. She had an uncle and an aunt, or maybe well, an uncle and an aunt that, that were believers in this message, the identical same message as the apostles preached. And when they would come to the house, her, my mom's mother and dad had told the kids, do not close your eyes when they pray. Keep your eyes open. Because they're full of the devil. They speak with tongues. And we don't want them to jump on you. <laughs> this Christianity and this Christianity were nothing whatsoever like this. Yes. Nothing whatsoever. And they're still not today. Amen. They're still not today. There is no question. You heard it. You read it. Paul said, if they come preaching any other gospel than the one we preach to you, let them be a person. Amen. Jesus said, except a man is born again of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John said, if you can tell the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, he that is of truth hears us. That's what John and the other apostles thought. He that heareth not us is of the spirit of error. Yes. Amen. Amen. we got to make up our minds. Am I loyal to the word of God or not? How loyal am I? I'm going to tell you, one of these days, the Lord's coming for a church. It's not going to be the church of the Reformers.
reformers. It's not going to be the church of the church fathers. It's going to be a church that still believes and preaches the exact same message that Jesus gave to the apostles that they yeah, preached. Yeah, yeah. You can call them ignorant and unlearned. Call them anything you want. Paul stood and said, after the way that some call heresy, so I worship the God of my father. Friend, I want to be loyal to the word of God. Amen. I know I've gone through it again. I hate doing that. But this is so important. If you get this in you where it will never be taken out of you, that's a wonderful treasure for you. Amen. I have had, I'll never forget talking to one minister. And I told him, I said, I said, what I believe is exactly what the apostle preached. He said, I can't argue with that. I said, well, there's safety in that. He said, you may think there's safety, that at least for now it may seem that way, but someday you're going to find out you was wrong. I said, man, what you're preaching is not what the apostles preached. He said, well, that's not for today. That's not for today. That was only for their age. That's not what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. He said, it's unto you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm glad to know that you can still be healed today. Amen. You can still have the power of God, the miraculous power of God working in your life today. Amen. That the age of the working of the power of God in people's lives hasn't died. It's still just as real as it was when the apostles preached this message. God still confirms it with signs following the same way he did then. Amen. Praise God. I'm so thankful to know that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I want to share one more thing. In Matthew 23, 23. There were some people who believed one God. In fact, if you didn't believe one God just like they did, they would kill you over it. They believed in tithes and offerings. They believed in living a very strict lifestyle. In fact, they had even made up a whole bunch of rules to live by that weren't even in the Bible. Now, I don't want to do that. Because the Bible teaches it, I want to live that way. Amen. You can't improve on the Word of God. You can't improve on the Word of God. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. But they were so strict about some things, but Jesus said this. Matthew 23, 23. Could someone read that? Matthew 23, 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the way to your matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done. What were those things? Judgment? Judgment, mercy, mercy, and faith. And faith. These ought we to have done and not to leave the other to have done. Now there are some as one God apostolic, there are some things we hold to very strongly. And many of our people were very strong about that there is only one God. And we need to be strong about that. That's the central truth of the entire word of God, that there is only one God. God Almighty said, I'm the only God there ever will be. I'm the only Savior. There will never be another Savior. Yes. Never. He said, there was no God before me. There will be no God after me. And there is no God beside me. I don't know of any. I only. He said, I created the heavens alone. Alone means there was no other person with me. He was either alone or he wasn't. He said he was alone. I believe he was telling the truth. Yes. Amen. 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 Said I created the heavens alone. I spread across the earth by myself. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God. There are many scriptures. There are many scriptures that deal with that. But sometimes we can be so strong on some of these. And there are some other things, and we can be very strong on some principles of Christian living. Things that the Bible tells a Christian they ought not to wear. 
We need to be strong on those. Those are important. I don't ever want to minimize. I see some people today to fit with the world and with other denominations and even to fit with these other groups. They are laying aside some of these teachings which are distinctive of Scripture. We better not lay aside the principles that God's Word says. But I want to tell you, there are some other matters that are weightier matters of the Word of God. And that is mercy. Sometimes we're so strong on one God and on living a holy life, but we stink when it comes to mercy. People struggle and they battle and we're ready to shoot them. need to be cutting each other's throat because somebody made a mistake. Jesus is, does not come in this age as a judge. That day will come, but he comes as a savior. He comes as a savior. We need to come to see people saved, not to see people destroy or judge. Amen. Mercy. Faith. That means confidence in the Lord and what he has said in all matters. Amen. Judgment. Judgment. Judgment there doesn't mean judging one another. Condemning one another. It means in another place the same thing as you. Jesus talked about the way you weight your matters and he talked about justice. Being fair. Being fair. Amen. Amen. You know, I may look at my brother, and he may be battling a certain area that I have no problem with. And I can put my brother down because of that. But I don't know where he came from. I don't know what he has gone through in his life. I don't know what experiences and struggles he had had. And maybe the reason he is battling with that is because he's had some experiences in life that made it very difficult for him in that area. I don't need to be trying to tear him up. I need to be trying to build him up, praying for him, trying to see him safe. We need to have a heart to try to see people safe. To see people set free, to see people healed physically, emotionally, and spiritually. To see them walk with God and know God and be in relationship with God. And we need to reach out in love to them. Not trying to kill each other and tear one another down and be condemned. And I'm going to tell you, you are so blessed because as far as I know, this is a church where you'll see in this church, I've had a lot of people talk about to me about, I've never been in a place where I felt so much love. I felt like people, they weren't ready to stab me or shoot me in the back because I battled with something, but they wanted to encourage me. They wanted to tell me, come on, get up, you can make it. Yeah, I know you've made a mistake there before, but come on, don't give up. Keep going. God wants you to walk with him. He wants you to know him. Oh, friend, we better have that kind of a heart. Amen. We better not, we better not fall in love so much with him. We have to learn those things. And forget about the heart of the matter is a walk with God, a relationship with God, a love one for the other and love for God. That we must love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our brothers ourselves. We must do unto our brother or sister as we would have others do unto us. Oh, friends, not only I don't ever do something stupid and get in some stupid, ignorant situation that's humiliating and embarrassing and totally wrong, I pray that God, by His grace, would help me never do that. But if that were ever to happen, I pray and believe by the grace of God, it won't. But if it were, oh, wouldn't I want somebody to love my soul? Wouldn't I want somebody to pray for me, to be a friend to me, to reach out to me? So what about my brother and sister? Amen. I, I know churches, and I'm not making this up, I know apostolic churches, pastors that have said, if someone comes to our church and is a lesbian or a homosexual and gets the Holy Ghost, we'll pray through and then I tell them, I want you to go someplace else to church. Said, because we don't want that man here. I don't ever want to be like that. I believe God can save a pimp. I believe God can save a prostitute. I believe God can save someone who is a victim to any kind of immorality. And it doesn't matter whether you're whether the person battling with homosexual feelings or heterosexual feelings that are out of, out of control and lustful feelings. God's still got some principles that we need to live by. Yes. Amen. Amen. And we need to get our flesh under subjection and live right according to what God's Word says. Amen. 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 Amen.